And we're going to talk about a particular renormalization group flow that we've found in this chain. Uh, so I'm going to start with a reasonably broad background to this model uh, to introduce, to motivate why it's interesting, and then talk about its relationship to a particular two-dimensional conformal field theory, and in particular to a non-compact conformal field theory, which is really the motivation to study this problem in the first place. I then present two exact solutions that we have found uh, for this model, so two different boundary conditions that allow us to solve it exactly, and then how thus that allows us to study its continuum limit and to see this RG flow. OK, so I should say at the beginning that I'm going to uh, use interchangeably the phrases staggered six vertex model and alternating XXE spin chain. And the difference between those two uh, phrases are that, well, this is the name I will give it when we were referring to the model as its formulation as a two-dimensional classical statistical model. And then the alternating XXE spin chain is the name we give it when we formulate it as a 1 plus 1D quantum model evolving in time. <coughs> so as always with these models uh, that are integrable, we're looking for an R matrix that satisfies the Young-Baxter equation, so just to very, very uh, broadly introduce this topic. So this is the diagrammatic form of the very well-known Yang-Baxter equation, where we have an R matrix acting on these three spaces, a vector, uh, the product of these vector spaces, and we assign these so-called spectral parameters, U1, U2, and U3, to each of the spaces. And we say that the parameter of the R matrix at each of these scattering events is the difference between the left spectral parameter and the right spectral parameter. Uh, when we orientate ourselves such that time is going upwards, and then the meaning of this equation is that the ordering of the scattering doesn't matter. So a very famous solution to this equation is the six vertex model given by this R matrix here. And we can define then a classical statistical model on the square lattice uh, by assigning spectral parameters u to the horizontal lines and zero to the vertical lines. And then on each of the vertices, this R matrix defines for us six possible uh, vertices with non-zero Boltzmann weights, um, where I've introduced here the parameter gamma, which is just a parameter of the six vertex model. OK, so this is a model which uh, most people are, are very familiar with. But in this formulation of it, it's very natural then to generalize it to the staggered six vertex model. So let me do that. So the staggered six vertex model is the same in the sense that we have the same uh, R matrix as before, but we stagger the spectral parameters on the square lattice in this way. So on the, in the horizontal direction, the spectral parameters alternate between 0 and pi over 2, and in the verti vertical direction between u and u plus pi over 2. Okay. So it becomes easier to study this model and more natural if we define this block R matrix. So if we coarse grain by one step, essentially, and this is then the tensor product of four R matrices, which for now I'll just write as R tilde. Um, and it's more natural this way because, well, the full block R matrix just takes one parameter. And then from there, we can define a new classical statistical model uh, with where you know, the most important object really in the way we study these models is the transfer matrix, which is the trace of the product of these R matrices. And just like, yep. No, you, because I was talking about the minus. Um, OK. <laughs> so in the same way that with no staggering, this formulation provided for us a six vertex model, so six possible vertices with non-zero Boltzmann weights. In this case, with this new block R matrix, we get 38 possible vertices. Uh, so we get a 38 vertex model. Oh, well, it turns out that if we do it this way, um, it becomes this model is mapped to the anti ferromagnetic Potts model. So there are other staggerings you could pick, but some of them would just be totally trivial, and we wouldn't change the universality class of the model when we take the continuum limit. When we do it this way, we know that it ends up giving us a conformal field theory in the continuum limit that we can understand. Yes, but I think 
it may be more natural, but we want something that definitely totally changes the model. So we could, I mean, do something like put u and 0 and u and 0. But if we put 0, then it's just a trivial sta staggering, because the R matrix, when the spectral parameter is equal to 0, is just the identity. So we want to introduce a staggering that is interesting enough um, to change the model. Uh, and essentially, that's why we want pi over 2, rather than just pi or just 0. So this is exactly, yeah. Um, so in general, we want to, with these models, study both the uh, version as a two-dimensional classical statistical model, but also as a 1 plus 1D model. And to do that, we need to take the Hamiltonian. So here I've introduced the R check matrix, which is the same as the R matrix, but just multiplied by a permutation operator. It just makes the notation easier here. Um, so we have this convenient formulation of the R, matrix, R check matrix, which is the weighted sum of the identity matrix plus this EI, which for now should just be considered as a convenient matrix in this form. We will see later that it's a generator of a particular algebra, that is the temporary Lieb algebra. But in this case, it allows us to study the Hamiltonian in a convenient way. So we study the Hamiltonian by taking the limit u going to 0. So this is the anisotropic limit, it's where the ratio of the two couplings in the horizontal and vertical direction become infinite. But in any case, this is just the most general definition of the Hamiltonian. We we'll take the derivative of the transfer matrix when the spectral parameter is equal to 0. And we see that for the six vertex model, we get just the sum of these EIs. And this is very convenient, because these EIs, when we expand them in terms of Pauli matrices, have this form. So then the full Hamiltonian in terms of <coughs> Pauli matrices just gives us the usual and very famous XXZ Hamiltonian. OK, so that's the relationship between XXZ and the six vertex model uh, with, with no staggering. So we want to ask what happens when we go through with this construction with the staggering. And we can write the Hamiltonian in this form, which is a not really as nice, but a relatively OK Hamiltonian written just in terms of Pauli matrices. But it's a lot neater when we use these, uh, the formulation in terms of these EMs, which has this form. So it's the first term is more or less the same as the XXE Hamiltonian. And then we have this interaction term between the EMs. OK. Exactly, yeah. So the, U go the staggering with pi over 2 is what essentially introduces this term in the end. Yeah. Yep. OK, so I'm going to say more about that in a, in a few minutes. I just want to say a couple of words on essentially my notation for this talk and what I mean when I say exactly solvable. I'm not even interested in calculating the eigenvectors here. So when I say exactly solvable, I just mean that we have a closed form for the eigenvalues. So the XXZ Hamiltonian is exactly solvable in the sense that we have this exact closed form for the energy eigenvalues in terms of these Bethe roots, uj, which are solutions to these Bethe ansatz equations. So in practical terms, this is a much more, much a numeric, it's numerically, it's a much easier problem to find the solutions to this equation and there then plug them back into this EI rather than just diagonalizing a very large matrix. And just to say that with periodic boundary conditions, the alternating XXZ Hamiltonian, um, which is the one I just presented, is also exactly solvable with some very similar Bethe ansatz equations. OK, so the point of all of this is essentially to study the continuum limit and to study the conformal field theory describing this alternating XXZ spin chain. So I just want to take one, two slides to essentially formalize my notation in terms of conformal field theory to give a essentially 30 second overview to this very, very broad topic. But so we have primary fields in any conformal field theory whose two point correlation functions satisfy the following equation where this introduces for us this scaling dimension delta phi corresponding to each primary field. They also satisfy 
these, uh, this equation for their three-point correlation functions, and this introduces the three-point coefficient, Cijk. And then, in addition to these primary fields, we also have descendant fields, and they are obtained by acting with various derivatives on the primary fields. And just to say, then, that the main numerical or uh, quantities of interest for us in this talk will really be these conformal dimensions, h and h bar. And the scaling dimensions that I introduced up here are uh, written in terms of these h and h bar as just the sum. And then the spin and many field is given by the difference. Okay, so that's just a very, very brief overview of conformal field theory, really just to introduce the uh, notation that I will use in this talk. And then just when we specialize to the case of two-dimensional conformal field theory, we have these, uh, this, the most important object being the Vera Sauer algebra, whose generators satisfy this commutation relation. And this introduces for us the central charge of the conformal field theory, which appears in this commutation relation. Then just to say that if we are considering a conformal field theory that is sufficiently nice, that is, that it's not logarithmic, et cetera, uh, then we have these primary states in the Hilbert space that are eigenstates of the L0 generator. Um, and we can span the rest of the Hilbert space by acting on these primary states with the rest of the generators of the Vera Sauer algebra. And just to say that these primary states are in one-to-one -one correspondence with the primary fields in the conformal field theory. So really the main observation to take away from this, as we will see is important later, is that the eigenvalues with respect to L0 of these descendant states differ by integers from the primary states. And this is, will be important when I present some numerics later. Then just to say that the Hamiltonian of this two-dimensional conformal field theory is written in terms of just L0 and L0 bar. So then we can get a sort of a feel uh, for intuitively what we mean when we say these lattice models are described by conformal field theories. So the hope is that the Hilbert space of the lattice Hamiltonian in the thermodynamic limit essentially becomes that of the Hilbert space that this CFD Hamiltonian is acting on in some sense that needs to be mathematically defined. OK, so how do we observe these quantities on the lattice in the most simplest case? And then for our non-compact case, we'll discuss that too. So when we study one of these Hamiltonians or one of these lattice models, numerically, we are obviously dealing with finite size. So this system size L is, a, well, it's all, for practical reasons, is always going to take a finite value. But we can relate the scaling behavior of the eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian or the log of the eigenvalues of the transfer matrix to this uh, data in the conformal field theory. So the first term in the Hamiltonian, uh, sorry, in the expansion of the Hamiltonian is just proportional to the system size. And it doesn't contain any information about the conformal field theory. But what we're really interested in is this term that is proportional to 1 over L. So when we write this in terms of Hamiltonians, we see that we have this quantity here, Vf, which is just the Fermi velocity, and it's a model-dependent quantity, which we have to calculate using various techniques like the Bethe ansatz. But we're really interested in what's inside the uh, parentheses here. So we see that we have the appearance of the central charge, which are introduced. And then we have the scaling dimension of some primary operator. So this uh, construction really gives us a practical way to just measure these quantities, the central charge and the scaling dimensions of the primary operators appearing. Um, because we can just see how these energy eigenvalues scale with the system size and therefore measure what's inside the parentheses. We have an example here of a particularly simple case where on the x-axis I have 1 over L. On the vertical axis, I have the scaling dimension delta phi i. And we see that as 1 over L goes to 0, all of these scaling dimensions converge towards discrete values. And these discrete values are those that are predicted by the conformal field theory describing the model. So you don't really go, you change your system size. Exactly, exactly. So we, s we uh, look at a, various, um, a number of sizes of L, uh, which correspond to each of these points here. And then we just extrapolate to 1 over L going to 0. So 
Ultimately, what this talk is about is the open chain uh, for the particular case we're considering. So we need to uh, just define uh, how all this works with boundaries. It's very, very similar to what we had before. The main difference in these two formulae is the appearance of this FS term, which is uh, the surface energy arising from the introduction of boundaries. So I've introduced here, I've shown here a, a graphic of an example of what happens in a particular case of a model with boundaries. And as we can see, all of these uh, scaling dimensions, all of these conformal dimensions, HI, actually go towards integers. So this means that in the model that, um, and with the boundary conditions that generated this data, they were sufficiently nice to make sure that the spectrum in the continuum limits just became integers, which means that, as I discussed earlier, we are just getting one representation of the virus over algebra. So essentially, the ground state of this Hamiltonian corresponds to some primary state, and then all of the, descent, the excited states correspond to these descendants that we obtain by acting with the virus over generators. So the lesson really just to take from this slide is that very often, we can find sufficiently nice boundary conditions to just identify um, one part of the conformal field theory of interest. OK. But as I said, the conformal field theory that will ultimately describe the model that we're interested in here is non-compact. So how does that impact things, and what does that mean? Well, generally speaking, when we go from the lattice to the field theory, the correspondence between the operators in the lattice and the primary operators is not as simple as just saying this lattice operator corresponds to this primary operator. What we actually have is something slightly more complicated. And that is that if we take the two-point correlation function, for example, of a lattice operator, when, and we expand it in terms of correlation functions in the CFT, we actually get a sum of two-point correlation functions in the CFT. But we are interested in the thermodynamic limit and the long-distance behavior, which means that we can just discard everything other than the first term, other than the lowest f uh, delta phi one. So this, when we have something nice like this, it gives us an unambiguous way to identify a lattice operator uh, with a primary operator in the CFT. However, when we have a non-compact CFT, we have a continuum of these delta phi i. So we can no longer just take the first term. And we have that the lattice uh, two-point correlation function is given by an integral of the two-point correlation functions in the non-compact CFT. So as we will see, this affects things in quite a dramatic way. In particular, when we go to study non-compact CFT on the lattice, and we try to use finite size scaling to study that. So this is the same formula I had before for the scaling of the energy eigenvalues. But since now these delta phi i can take continuous values, what happens is as we increase uh, the system size l, and we go towards 1 over l going to 0, we get the appearance of an infinite number of these uh, delta phi i, all with very, very slow convergence, and in particular with logarithmic convergence. So this is just the uh, two-point correlation function of the lattice operators. So we still have that the CFT correlation functions will satisfy the usual relations with one particular scaling dimension. Oh, so in this case, OK, so I guess let me see if I understood your question. You're saying that we see this on the lattice. This is all we know. How do we know that? Um, it's essentially an interpretation, because we can measure the, conform the central charge, for example. So we can see that okay, the ground state gives us what we would expect. OK, let, let's posit that um, the CFT in the continuum limit is this non-compact CFT. The only way that we could possibly observe it with finite scaling is this one. So 
yeah, it's, there's no proof here, of course, because there's not really any distinction. I, maybe this is your point. It's not really any distinction between um, an infinite degeneracy and a continuum, because we only ever have a finite number of states. We have to, we can do two things. We can say that, well, the only way to observe a continuous spectrum is to see an infinite number of states going towards zero. And secondly, we can see that the correlation, that the scaling, the extrapolation is logarithmic. And that's what we would expect also if from taking the next uh, term in the expansion. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I agree it's not a proof, but in any any time we are introducing numerics, we're never going to have any sort of mathematical proof anyway. So, um, so just as uh, on a pragmatic note, then, because of these logarithmic corrections, in order to see that these states are indeed converging towards zero logarithmically, we just need very large lattices. I, we can't just do direct diagonalization, otherwise we'll be trying to diagonalize a matrix of billions very quickly. So we need exact solutions in order to get these eigenvalues. OK, so this just summarizes then uh, the, this section that I've just talked about and the whole motivation for this model. So we know that the in, with periodic boundary conditions, this chain, this alternating x, x, z chain, is described by a non-compact CFT, or we interpret it in that way, which is very interesting. We also know that with the data that I presented, boundary conformal field theories, when we find a sufficiently nice boundary condition, are in some sense simpler than bulk conformal field theories. And we can access just one part of the conformal field theory. So we're looking for conformally invariant boundary conditions in this chain in order to try to get a hold of this non-compactness that we observe. And we ideally want them to be exactly solvable so that we can study these very high sizes that we need. So I try to put in the caveat as usually in the sense that if we find a sufficiently nice boundary, conformal field, uh, nice boundary condition, as in the data that I showed, we get, in that case, just one representation of the Virasaur algebra. Whereas if we study it with periodic boundary conditions, we have everything. We have all of the primary states and all of their descendants. Whereas with a boundary conformal field theory, we can very often just get one primary state and its descendants. The other more general thing I can OK, the best explanation I can give is that in a boundary CFT, we are only talking about the upper half plane, and we only have one copy of the Virasaur algebra. We don't have ln bar. We only have ln. So from the very beginning, we definitely have half what we have in the bulk CFT. And then if we do things, if we are careful about it, we can get even less than half. OK, so let me just summarize what is already known about the uh, boundary conditions in this model. So this is actually the same data I presented before. Um, so in the staggered six vertex model, there exists a boundary condition that we found that results in uh, this spectrum where we only get integers. And the coefficients of each of the, the number of states that go towards each of these integers is exactly that which we would expect from the discrete character of the Euclidean black hole CFT. While this is very interesting, it's not what we're looking for. We ultimately wanted to see, with open boundaries, this convergence with uh, logarithmic, uh, logarithmically towards 0. So it's very nice to get this interesting integer spectrum, but we're looking for a continuous one. So we need to keep looking. So I'm going to summarize what it is we found and, and the boundary conditions that do indeed, in the end, result in the <coughs> this continuous spectrum. So I introduced earlier the Hamiltonian of the alternating XXZ spin chain in terms of these matrices EM. And then with the open case, we also have this boundary term. And I'm going to introduce this boundary parameter alpha. So then essentially the conclusion and the point of this talk is that there are two very nice values of alpha, such that the model becomes exactly solvable. And that's one value of alpha 
uh, we get this non-compact continuous spectrum that we're looking for. At another value of alpha, we just get the more usual compact discrete spectrum. And then anywhere in between, uh, if we perturb slightly away from alpha equals zero, we flow under RG towards the compact model. OK, so I'm going to say all of that a lot slower, essentially, for the rest of the talk. So let me just reset up and essentially repeat what I said to introduce this chain again. This is the Hamiltonian uh, written in terms of Pauli matrices. I've already written essentially three times now. This is the temporary Lieb generator in terms of Pauli matrices. And then with periodic boundary conditions, so this is without the boundary term, we have this, and this gave us the continuous spectrum. Okay, so I'm just repeating myself, essentially. That's why I went through this slide very quickly. So let, what we're looking for is, as I said, exactly solvable conformally invariant boundary conditions in this chain. And we know how this works for the XXE chain, where we have no alternating variables. So let's just study that, essentially, for inspiration to see how we can maybe solve the alternating case. So the open XXE chain, one particular boundary condition, which we understand very well, is this one. So just to be careful here, the sum only runs to n minus 1 here. And then we have a boundary term, a boundary field acting at the first and the last side. It turns out that this Hamiltonian is actually just the sum of temporary leap generators, but stopping again just one before the end. And this Hamiltonian is exactly solvable and conformally invariant. So we understand how that works. So if we look at the alternating XXZ case, the most general way we can write the open case is the following. So we just have this very general term here, boundary terms. But we know that when the XXZ Hamiltonian is written entirely in terms of EI, it is conformally invariant and exactly solvable. So this suggests that maybe the way to find an exactly solvable conformally invariant boundary condition for the alternating case is to somehow find some boundary uh, terms such that the whole Hamiltonian is also written entirely in terms of EI. That will turn out to be the case, as we'll see. So how can we find the exact solution that does this? Well, very generally speaking, if we want to find an open model with, uh, that is exactly solvable, we need to find these K matrices. And these K matrices will satisfy the boundary analog of the Yang-Baxter equation is written here. And once we find, so we have R already. R is the R block R matrix of the staggered six vertex model. So we want to find these k. Once we find k, we put them back into this Hamiltonian, and we have an open, exactly solvable Hamiltonian. So we can proceed in two ways. We can either just try to solve this equation and find these k, or we can hope that it has already been solved. The reason that we expect at this point that there probably is a solution for this is that there's a whole uh, branch of this field devoted to constructing integral models from Lie algebras. So we might expect that uh, this has been done in such a way before as to give us our R matrix. So I'll say more about that. The point is that if we dig deep enough into the literature and we find this D22 twisted affine Lie algebra, which I won't say anything more about other than when you go through this construction to make an integral model from such an algebra, it turns out that the R matrix you end up with is exactly our R matrix of the staggered six vertex model, with a caveat that you have to <coughs> write everything in the appropriate basis, and you have to trans uh, relate the parameters in both of these models in a consistent way. Point is, it's possible. So. Um, we might hope that somebody else then has studied this D22 model and therefore solved this equation already and found these k. This turns out to be true. So Raphael Nepomeci and his collaborators found these k matrices in the context of this D22 model. So what remains for us to do then is take these k matrices and translate them into the language of this alternating XXZ chain. And again, when I say translate, I mean write everything in the basis such that the two R matrices are the same and transform the parameters in the consistent way. So when we do this and we take these K matrices, one of the K matrices that appear in uh, this paper, and we go through with this process, 
it turns out to give us this extraordinarily nice Hamiltonian entirely written in terms of temporary Lieb algebra generators, which we should say is quite amazing given that um, this paper was written without knowing that there's any relationship to this chain. And it turns out that this k-matrix ends up producing such a simple Hamiltonian. So we now have, yep. Uh, we discovered it because the bethe ansatz equations for the periodic case are the same as the bethe ansatz equations. So it gave us a motivation to essentially prove that they're the same. So that's how. Yes. Uh, quite possibly, but um, in this case, we're only interested in the n equals one case. Um, so we have this exactly solvable open Hamiltonian with one problem. That is that we don't have the exact solution, even though we know that it's exactly solvable. So again, Raphael Nepomeci and collaborators um, tried to find a solution for this model, but found a Bethe ansatz solution that only gave half of the spectrum. So there's something missing. But we would hope, with this additional information that we have, that essentially that this uh, chain can be written in terms of these temporary Lieb generators, that maybe we can find this exact solution. So how can we do that? Well, let's go back to our alternating XXZ open Hamiltonian. There are four terms. There was a next to nearest neighbor interaction. We're going to represent that with blue dots. The nearest neighbor interaction we represent with black dots. And the boundary interaction with red dots. Now, there was this three-side interaction as well. But we will be interested in the limit gamma going to 0. So this interaction will disappear. So in this graph, I'm not going to bother representing it. So what I have here is a chain of six sites. Um, and I've just written sites 2, 4, and 6 above sites 1, 3, and 5 to make the picture clearer. But I haven't done anything to the chain. And we're going to now take this limit, gamma going to 0. And just to say that if we recall that this blue interaction was actually a xxx interaction, the <laughs> next to nearest neighbor interaction. So let's take the limit, gamma going to 0. It turns out that these black interactions actually just disappear. They were also proportional to sine squared gamma. And if we're careful about it, we see that the red interactions actually just become equal to the blue interactions. And why is that important? Well, the blue interactions were xxx interactions. So now we have a periodic xxx Hamiltonian, which, well, in a sense, it's topologically equivalent to it. So that is a huge, huge constraint on what the bethe ansatz equations should be for this model. So these are the bethe ansatz equations that were conjectured in this paper that uh, was going towards a solution of the D22 model. And it was known in this paper that they didn't quite give the whole spectrum. But we now know that whatever the correct bethe ansatz equations are, when we take this gamma going to zero limit, they have to reduce to that of the periodic xxx case. And there is only one sensible guess remaining when you go through with that construction. And it turns out to be this one with the eigenvalues of the chain uh, having this form. So once we have this guess, it becomes very easy to check. We can just diagonalize the Hamiltonian for some small sizes and then find all the solutions to these equations. And we see that it does indeed reproduce the whole spectrum, as well as all of the states um, that were correct in the original bethe ansatz equations. It gives us all of the new ones as well. Um, so there's a few steps in between, though, because you need to know the form of the eigenvalue in terms of the Bethe roots. So normally what Raphael Nepomuk tried to do was an ansatz for the eigenvalues of the transfer matrix in terms of Bethe roots. And once you have that, you can definitely derive the Bethe ansatz equations. But the problem was that his ansatz didn't work. So when you did that, you end up with these Bethe ansatz equations. and uh, your original ansatz was not correct for a whole part of the spectrum. So another way to, s to arrive at these new Bethe ansatz equations is to slightly modify that original ansatz, go through with the usual construction of making sure the roots of, that, uh, of the eigenvalues all cancel. The, sorry, the, the poles all cancel. 
And when you do that, you end up, it's another way to end up at these equations. No, this has solutions which uh, results in eigenvalues that don't appear in the spectrum of the model. So it, there are some solutions, there is an overlap of solutions of these uh, equations. Yeah. Okay. Uh, oh, apologies. Eta is I gamma. I thought I changed all of them. <laughs> but you, you study these models and the limit gamma goes to zero. Um, I studied them for all values of gamma, yeah. but the way I found kind of way exactly, yeah. exactly, yeah, yeah. Um, so let's now that we have these correct Bethe Ansatz equations, we can use them, use the finite size scaling procedure to study the continuum limit. Lo and behold, we get exactly what we were looking for in the first place. That is this continuous spectrum with logarithmic corrections. We know from the bulk CFT, and we also know from the original Bethe Ansatz, uh, original conformally invariant boundary conditions I showed in the beginning, that it's somehow related to the black hole conformal field theory. And the original Bethe, uh, in boundary conditions gave us the discrete character, the black hole CFT. So we would hope that if we measure maybe the density of states here somehow, we can relate it to the continuous part of the black hole CFT. But I don't yet have results on that to present to you. OK. There were, as you saw, I showed earlier, many uh, other k-matrices that uh, were found in, in that paper on the D22 model. So it's a natural question then to ask, what happens to them? Do they also give us a continuous spectrum, or do they give us something else? So we'll go back here, we'll take another K matrix, we'll go through with the same procedure I presented called the translation procedure, and we end up after quite a decent bit of work with a Hamiltonian that looks like this. So again, this part is exactly the same as the Hamiltonian I just presented, but we have this boundary term here with a temporary leap algebra generator acting on the first and second last sites. And in this case, we actually get the Bethe Ansatz equations for free. They were already there, they were correct, so we can just immediately study the continuum limit without having to derive new ones. And again, the same form of the energy eigenvalues in terms of these roots. And in this case, we get something that we're more used to, that is uh, a discrete spectrum. Um, the interesting thing is, though, when we look carefully at what these uh, numbers are, they are exactly what we would expect from looking at the anti-ferromagnetic POTS model with free boundary conditions, which until now we didn't have an exact solution for. So we've kind of stumbled into uh, some Bethe Ansatz equations that give us the uh, anti-ferromagnetic POTS model with free open boundary conditions. OK, so that, yep. When I look at this equation, I, I don't see very much why you get in some case some log and in some other case no log. Oh, so yeah, it's a little bit. I mean, what it comes from is the low energy spectrum in all of these cases is given by roots that are either on this uh, line or this line. And then um, essentially they're strings, but yeah, OK, we can call them that. But they're all of the solutions. They're strings, but like the whole solution is strings. So this is a typical solution to some state in the low energy spectrum. And the way we get a logarithmic uh, state that ends up converging um, corresponding to a continuous state is moving one of these guys up here, where we have a, a different number of states on the top and the bottom line. It turns out, maybe it's, I guess, not so obvious to see, but this only occurs for the other set of equations. It's, um, for now, I can really just say it's a numerical result. We only get these guys for, for this case. Um, OK. so. It's then very natural to write down a slightly more general Hamiltonian uh, that we've been considering, where, which is this one. And this alpha for two special points corresponds to the two cases that I just presented. So alpha equals 0 gave us this non-compact continuous spectrum. And alpha equals minus 1 over cos gamma gave us this discrete free anti-ferromagnetic pot spectrum. OK, but there are two things we can do. We can generalize this model in two directions.
One direction is to say, okay, what happens for other values of alpha? We will look at that. But a slightly more subtle one is to put in a different representation for these EM. So all along, until now, I've just been cons considering these EM as convenient functions, particular matrices or convenient functions of Pauli matrices. But I've mentioned that they are actually generators of an algebra, the temporally Lieb algebra. So we can find a new representation for these EM, plug them back into the Hamiltonian and see what that gives us. So I'm going to just take a couple of minutes to review the temporally Lieb algebra, even if many or if not all of you have seen it before. So the temporally Lieb algebra is um, defined by these three equations. So a uh, generator multiplied by itself gives us back this generator with this particular weight, the square root of Q, which is just a parameter of the algebra. I should say that this Q is also the Q of the Q state POTS model. Then we have a non-trivial relation in the middle, and the last relation just tells us that there is essentially no interaction between temporally Lieb algebra generators that are more than one site away from each other. This is what is the representation we've been dealing with up until now. But, and we can check quite easily that it satisfies these three equations. But we can find all sorts of other EI that satisfy these three equations and plug them back into the Hamiltonian. Just as a aside, uh, I want to say that in general, there is this pretty intimate relationship between temporally Lieb algebra representations on the lattice and representations of the Verisoa algebra in the continuum limits, which means that whenever we have a Hamiltonian of this kind that is entirely written in terms of these EI, we can look at the different representations of that Hamiltonian and very often derive new results about conformal field theory and about the representation of the Verisoa algebra, um, which is essentially what we're doing here. So it's just a very general aside comment. So let's look at some other representations. One particular representation of EI that we could pick, it's very famous, is called the loop representation. We're going to be interested in here in another one called the RSOS representation, um, which is most naturally introduced in the context of height models. These are classical statistical models in the lattice, which some people here will be exceptionally familiar with. Um, so this Boltzmann weight is given by uh, of the bottom weight of each tile is a function of the, no the particular heights that live on the vertices of each of these tiles, subject to the condition that they must differ only by plus or minus one. And then we define the partition function in the usual way. So the sum of all the possible, uh, all the bottom weights of the possible configurations. So as usual, we can write um, the tra the, this model as a Hamiltonian evolving in time, or just a transfer matrix. And in either case, the Hamiltonian or the transfer matrix can be written in terms of EI, um, which I will define up here in a second. But these EI act on constant time slices. So if time is going in the vertical direction, space in the horizontal, then each one of these guys in the horizontal direction looks something like this. So these EI act on a state that looks like this. And then the representation that we'll be interested in is EI having this explicit form, where we s these SHs are just defined in this particular way. It's not The details of this are not important really at all. The only thing I'm trying to say here is that there is another totally different representation of these EI that is not at all the same as the vertex representation we were interested in. And it, uh, the motivation to introduce a new representation comes from a model such as this one. OK, so we have a new EI. So let's now, and it's OK, I should just add that what I've just defined is the A series representation of the temporary Lieb algebra. And we're going to take that and plug it back into this Hamiltonian, as well as varying this alpha. So I'm going to present some numerical results. And before I do that, I want to define this quantity that I'm calling the first gap. So if you recall the way that the energy eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian scaled, if we take the difference between the first excited state and the ground state, they will scale in this way. This is the Fermi velocity I mentioned earlier. And these are the conformal dimensions corresponding to each of those two states. 
So we can just measure this quantity. And let's just give some things some particular values, just for concreteness. Let's take gamma equals pi over 4. And if we go back to our alpha equals 0 case, it turns out that this first discrete gap gives us a half. Now, you might object at this point and say that, oh, but I told you that this spectrum is continuous. So surely this discrete gap should be 0. It's only continuous in the vertex representation of the temporary leap algebra. I'm talking here now about this A-series RSRS representation, where we don't get this um, <coughs> non-compact spectrum. So for now, we can just really consider this as the experimental result. We plug the RS rep representation into here. We take alpha equals 0, and we take gamma equals pi over 4, and we measure this quantity. So let's do the same thing for the other special value of alpha that gave us this free anti-ferromagnetic POTS case. And this quantity just gives us 2. So the question is, if we take alpha somewhere in between these two values, what are we going to get? Are we going to get 2? Are we going to get half? Are we going to get something in between? Well, the answer lies in this figure. So the blue curve is the numerical approximation to the first gap, as I just defined it, for alpha equals 0, which we see converges towards a half. The orange curve is the numerical approximation to the gap over here. And then the yellow curve is when we just put alpha slightly away from 0. And as we see, because it's only slightly away from 0, these uh, numerical approximations for low size are very similar to the case alpha equals 0. But when we fix alpha and then take the continuum limit, we see this convergence towards 2, which means that we're seeing a repulsive uh, RG. Sorry, this is a fixed R, uh, point under RG flow, and then there is it's a repulsive fixed point flowing towards the compact model that we already studied. OK, so just that brings me to summarize all of that. So we found this exact solution of the open alternating XXZ chain with this continuum that we were looking for in the first place. By accident, we kind of stumbled into an exact solution of the anti-ferromagnetic POTS model with free boundary conditions. So the continuum limit of that was obviously already known, but we, that it was known through direct diagonalization, etc. Between these two points, we found this RG flow that I've just presented. And then really the next big step in this is to interpret all of that in terms of the Euclidean black hole CFT, which we know it's certainly related to. And now we want to find out exactly how. So thank you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> 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 I like it. <laughs> yep. So you, you, you explained uh, that we could see the Dirac-Euro symmetry from the temporary leap algebra. Yes. But in this Euclidean black hole CFT, you expect a larger symmetry than Dirac-Euro. Yes. And can you see that as well? Um, well, I'm not sure you can see it f just from Vera Zero generators, because I think the point is, as some people here will know more about than me, you can write these Vera Zero generators as, um, as temporary Lieb algebra generators. And you, you hope that when you take the thermodynamic limits, um, those, that form of, okay, I don't, won't be able to write this exactly, but you hope that you can do something like this. some function of these EI. So this is the L0 generator as a function of system size, and you hope that you can write it as some function of these temporary Lieb algebra generators. And you hope that as L goes to infinity, this function will satisfy everything um, that the Vera Zero algebra generator should. But I think you're talking about some other symmetry operator that in addition to Vera Zero, um, And so I doubt. I think you would need something more than temporary leap um, in that case, because it's, it's a totally different symmetry that's not related to Vera Soro. So I don't see any reason to believe that we could write these new symmetry generators in terms of temporary leap. So I don't know. Perhaps, yes. Um, maybe there is, but it's, 
I, I don't know if that is the case or not. It may be. You didn't write the simple job. Is it the same as in the Yes, exactly, yes. I did not write it. Thank you. Um, so there's a couple of ways to write it. So, so this is the central charge of the parafermion black hole. Uh, sorry, the parafermion model. And then there's a slight subtlety here in that the identity in the black hole conformal field theory not being normalizable, which means that we don't observe it on the lattice, which means that the ground state that we see has this essentially effective central charge. So this is the effective central charge that we see, which um, we interpret as being the central charge of the black hole conformal field theory with some um, exponents. Okay, but we do see exactly what we expect. Yes, sorry, sorry, sorry. We have that. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So we could, if we want, plug the loop representation back in here, and we get the same thing as the Riddick's representation. So the. Yeah, yeah, so, um, well, I mean, we can just do it. We can just write down an explicit representation of these EMs in terms of loops and then write down the Hamiltonian just explicitly and calculate its spectrum. And when so we how is the weight of the loops changed? Um, the weight of the loops is still, uh, so we still have this relation, which means that the weight of the loop is just oh. the square root of Q. So that doesn't change. So it's just some kind of uh, how the length is. Um, so I'm not sure there's a way to physically, geometrically interpret this term. Um, it's, I mean, yeah. <laughs> don't know what else to say about it other than. <laughs> Yes. How, how, how can you say that this, uh, how can you decide that this uh, is no compound field? So what happens is we, if I go back to the, yeah, so in this case, if we take the um, RSOS representation, all of these states just disappear. So the RS representation is smaller than the vertex or the loop representation. So all of those states, which no longer appear in the RS representation, happen to be the ones that have these logarithmic corrections. And by the way, the black hole, it will be uh, in, in the RS West or in the uh, No, black hole, we will only ever be able to talk about it really in terms of parafermion C of T. So yeah, it, re it really only lives in the kind of vertex or loop representation. Yeah, it's not diagonalizable when it's open like this. Yeah. In this, it works in exactly the same way as X, X, Z, uh, as open X, X, Z. Yeah, it is diagonalizable when it's periodic, and it's not when it's open. Um, presumably, you would still have. Yeah, presumably, what will happen is your primary states will no longer be eigenstates of the L0 generator, and it should be logarithmic. Presumably, that will happen, yes. But it doesn't affect any of this. Because as I said, we only need the eigenvalues to calculate all of this. Um, so we don't need to worry about um, if it's not an eigenvector. We can still calculate the eigenvalues. So this might be the logarithmic Um, that seems to be the correct interpretation. But the only concrete statement I can make is that the Hamiltonian is not diagonalizable when it's open. <laughs>